see everybody here this morning. If you will stand, welcome. Welcome to Anthony Grove Baptist Church. If you can find somebody outside your aisle, crawl out and find them and tell them how glad you are to see them here this morning. of the Lord this morning. Amen. You may be seated. Amen. It's good to see you in God's house. If you look inside your bulletin, you'll see the numerous uh, opportunities that you have to uh, serve the Lord and be engaged in the work of God. There's a couple of things that I've been asked to uh, call to your attention this morning. Uh, one of those is, is uh, recently... A guy by the name of David Ross was in a motorcycle accident right, right up the road. He was ri riding his motorcycle, and a deer ran out, and he hit it. And there was a couple who stopped and directed traffic and, and, and possibly even saved his life. And he has asked if, the, if you were that couple that uh, stopped and intervened. He'd like to know who you are so he could thank you. So if you're that person, if you'd let me know, uh, I will pass that on to him. And so uh, his name is David Ross. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had a team from Anthony Grove to do disaster recovery work in Puerto Rico. <laughs> <clears throat> that was weak. A couple of weeks ago, we had a couple. Uh, we had twelve people to go to do disaster recovery in Puerto Rico. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> well, God blessed and moved. Uh, the 
North Carolina Baptists have extended their partnership with Puerto Rico. And so uh, there's so many people have expressed an interest that we actually have two other trips lined up. One is for February the 10th. One is for February the 17th. Back behind uh, the hallway behind us, behind the baptistry here is a, a, a sign-up sheet. If you'd go by, if you'd like to go February the 10th, 17th, put down the date, which one of those dates you'd like to go. There's only 12 to a team is the maximum that we can send. Uh, the logistics there just won't allow more than that at one time. And so if you're one of those folks and you'd like to go and you'd like to help uh, those folks who suffered two hurricanes in two weeks' time, uh, then go back there and put your name on the list. <clears throat> and then in two weeks from uh, yesterday, we're going to have uh, our annual car show. I believe it's our seventh one called Big Iron Saturday. Uh, all the funds raised go to help our youth go to camp. It costs somewhere between twenty-five and forty thousand dollars to send our youth to camp, and uh, this helps defray the cost for them. We have lots of these little posters here. They won't be good in two weeks. Okay, after two weeks, won't do any good. So grab you some. When you go to the restaurant that you like to eat at, say, hey, would you mind putting this up? Go put it on the door to convenience store. But hand them out. Help us get out the word. Along with that, there's a couple of other things that I've been asked to remind you of. One is, is they need silent auction items. If you have something you'd like to donate, if you just bring that to the church. Next, they need donations of concessions. Those of you that are great bakers, you know, and you have your favorite thing, you know, that um, Butterfinger cake or that Sundrop pound cake, whatever it is that you are good at, <clears throat> they, they need donations of concessions. Also, uh, homemade ice cream. Uh, Paul Jenkins in our church has donated a motorcycle, and you can get tickets to get a chance to win that. Now, you might say, now, preacher, I'm not a motorcycle rider. Well, if you can win it, sell it. Put the money in your pocket, okay? I'm going to win it and donate what I, I sell it for to the youth, okay? <clears throat> but anyhow, the youth have those tickets if you'd like to get one in the lobby when you exit. So I hope you'll keep that in mind. And then lastly, I want to ask you to take out your connection card. So the little card looks like this. Please fill out the front side. And then on the back side, if you'd write down your prayer concerns, uh, and then when the offering plate comes around, if you put your connection card in there, the ushers will bring them up. We're going to pray over them at the end of the service. Then we'll make a prayer list and hand it out to the whole church to pray for on Wednesday night. So I hope you'll take a moment and do that. For those that are visiting with us today, we're glad you're here. Please fill out your connection card and hold on to it. And then when you exit, as you go through the lobby on the right-hand side, I'll be standing out there at our welcome center and I have an information packet and also have a gift I'd like to give you. So I hope you'll stop by and see me on your way out. Well, as we join our hearts together, we want to ask God to anoint this place with His Holy Spirit. If you would, join your heart with mine as we pray. Gracious God, we understand and realize that you are an omnipresent God, that you are everywhere. But God, you have promised that where two or three are gathered in your name, that God, your presence would be real and near and dear. And so, oh God, I pray that you would anoint this place with your Holy Spirit. May the fellowship, may the singing, may the preaching, may the praying, may the giving, may the decisions that are made here, may all of it, God, have the touch of heaven on it. For we make our prayer in Jesus Christ's name, amen. Let's all stand. You know, the Word of God tells us that He's a friend who sticks to us closer than a brother. Are you a friend of God this morning? Let me hear you. Are you a friend of God this morning? Amen. Let's sing this morning. Who am I that you are mindful of me, that you hear me when I call? Is it true that you are thinking of me, how you love me? It's amazing.
friend. Oh, what a mighty God we serve. Folks, Tim, there's going to be a day, and I don't believe it's going to be very long. Amen. And that's okay. I hope I'm right. Amen. He's going to split the skies, folks. He's going to carry us. He's going to take us up out of here. Amen. And every knee, every knee, not a few, every knee is going to bow. Every tongue is going to confess. What's it going to confess, folks? That Jesus Christ is Lord of Lords, King of Kings. Amen. Let's worship Him this morning. Holy Spirit, pray. Let your power fall, 
Spirit, rain down on this place this morning. Hallelujah. We're reading God's word, for if the willingness is there, the gift is acceptable according to what one has, not according to what one does not have. Let us pray. And I thank you, Father God, that you are our friend. And Lord, I realize and know that as we gather here today that how much I appreciate you being such a great and powerful God. And Lord, I pray for our service today. Lord, I pray that as Dr. Bean stands before us this morning, Lord, that you will anoint him with your Holy Spirit. And Father, that you be able to speak greatly through this man here today. Lord, that it will touch our hearts and lives, Lord, and make us have a different attitude about witnessing and talking to others about you. Tell them how good and great you are, Lord, and how we believe that you are soon returning. And Lord, I ask your blessings upon the offering today. Lord, I ask that whatever is received, that you will multiply it, that it will be used for the furthering of your gospel, Father, to that it will reach others in other parts of the world and here in our great homeland. And we thank you again, Father, for loving us. Have your will and your way in this service today. And what's accomplished, we're going to say Jesus did it. Because, Lord, we do ask it in the precious name of Jesus Christ. Amen.
Good morning, church. I have heard this morning, I don't know how many times, about what an awesome God we serve. And we do. But you know, long, long before you ever knew him, he served you. And he serves us till this day. And that's kind of what this song's about. It amazes me sometimes when you think about the fact that, you know, it's hard to imagine, if you be honest, it is for me, that he ever walked this earth, this same earth we're on. And yet he was here for a purpose, and that was to serve us. And how greatly he did that. I hope you enjoy this song. When I think how he came so far from glory
Amen. Thank you, Brother Joe. He would do that because of who he is, not because of who I am. If you look inside your bulletin, you'll find an outline of today's message. We're starting a new series called the Drone Series. And today we're going to be looking at and answering, where is God? In Jeremiah chapter 23, verse 24, I'm going to ask all that are able to please stand in the honor of the reading of God's Word. Jeremiah 23, verse 24. No one can hide where I cannot see him, says the Lord. I will fill all of heaven and earth, says the Lord. And then in Psalms 139, verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? If I go up to the heavens, you are there. If I make my bed in the depths, you are there. If I rise on the wings of the dawn, if I settle on the far side of the sea, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. If I say, surely the darkness will hide me, and the light will become night around me, even the darkness will not be dark to you. The night will shine like the day, for darkness is as light to you. Let us pray. Gracious God, Help us to understand today what it means that you are an omnipresent God, that God, you are everywhere. And Father, may you rain down on this place today. God, may we leave this place with the knowledge that wherever we go, we're never alone. Speak to us now, God, through your word, in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Angela, uh, if you'll play the first 30 seconds of this uh, opener about drones to open up our series. That's good enough. Thank you. I want to give you a visual image of the story that I'm about to tell. It's told to me by one of our church members who's serving in the United States military. They actually fly one of these drones and said the call came in that I was supposed to watch a certain person. This is over in Iraq. And so they watch them day after day after day. He said, you know, I watched this guy play soccer in the backyard with his son. And said, as I watched him play soccer, says, you know, uh, he seemed like a normal guy. It's the next day I'm watching him, and I'm watching him beat up his wife. And then the next day, you know, he see him outside, he's grilling out. And said, I watched him every day for three weeks, everything that he was doing. And says, then I got a call from headquarters and said, he's a terrorist, take him out. That person that was taken out by the United States military, never knew they were being watched. There are drones everywhere. They're being used by all different types of industry. For example, in the agricultural industry, they're using uh, to keep watch over crops and even to apply pesticides. Uh, In the surveying business, they're uh, even being used, uh, drones are. Drones are uh, uh, being experimented with Amazon and with Domino's about making deliveries to your house. So drones are all around us. They're they're used for search and rescue. They're used in disaster recovery to to see what's going on. They're even used with infrared in disaster recovery to locate people that may still be alive that need to be rescued. 
but they're also used just by a common everyday person. We have a person in our church that has one, and I was going to get them to fly it around in here, and I thought, well, maybe they'd crash it, and that wouldn't be very good. <laughs> but several weeks ago, I saw drones up close and personal. We we're having a, a, a family get-together at my sister-in-law's house, and all of a sudden, we hear something going, going, bzzz. And we look up, and there's a drone flying over us. And my sister-in-law says, is that a drone? And then it disappears. And then it comes back. And then it disappears. And she said, I think that's the neighbor. I'm going to go down there and tell him. I don't appreciate him flying that thing over my house. Well, everybody there was Christians. We weren't doing anything we were ashamed of. But just the fact that somebody could fly a drone right over your house and watch everything you're doing is a little spooky. It's a little creepy. And so many times when we come to the doctrine of God that we're going to talk about today, some people find it unsettling that God is everywhere and he's watching everything we do. But I hope that when you leave today that the truth of God's omnipresence will be an encouragement and a comfort to you. This truth impacts our lives in at least three ways. Number one, the presence of God challenges me. In Psalm 139, verse 7, the psalmist says, Where can I go from your spirit? Where can I flee from your presence? In other words, wherever I go, God is already there. Uh, when we get out of church, some of you are going to go home and have dinner. God's going to already be at home before you get there. Some of you are going to go to the restaurant. He's going to be in the restaurant before you get there. God is everywhere all the time in all of the universe. Now, that bothers people so bad that they've actually come up with theologies to ease their conscience. Let me give you one of them. One of them is called deism. Thomas Jefferson was a deist. Deists believed that God created everything, put it in motion, and then God just stepped away and it all just kind of runs itself. And you see, that is comforting to people like Thomas Jefferson because they think God is not watching everything I do. But he is, whether you believe it or not. He is watching everything you do because he is everywhere. Now, why does it challenge me? Well, because God knows all about me. In verse 1, O Lord, you have searched me and you know me. God knows everything there is to know about you. And he still loves you. God knows everything there is about you, and he still wants to have fellowship with you. He knows all about you. You know, one of the things about uh, technology, and one of the things I love about our new facilities here is we uh, have such a, a great sound system, but you know, sometimes it works against you. I think it was the first or second time we were in our new facilities here. I forgot to turn my microphone off. The people out there in the sound booth had stepped away from the booth, and they were fellowshipping over in the side, and I was out in the lobby, and I'm a yak, 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 yakking away. And somebody comes running out there and said, Preacher, shh, shh, shh. they can hear everything you're saying out in the sanctuary. Well, don't be saying stuff you don't want people to hear. Yeah. I said, okay, thank you, and I turned it off. But you understand that God hears everything and sees everything, and he knows everything there is to know about us. You see, sometimes we think people didn't hear that conversation. People didn't see what I just did, but God did. Let me give you an example from the Old Testament, Moses. Moses was being groomed to be the next ruler of the world, a prince of Egypt. And he walked outside one day, and he saw the Hebrew people being mistreated, and he got mad, and in his anger, he killed another Egyptian. Notice here what it says. After looking in all directions to make sure no one was watching, Moses killed the Egyptian and hid the body in the sand. Guess what? 
He looked this way, looked this way, looked this way, looked that way, but he didn't look this way. You see, somebody is always watching, and that is God because he is present everywhere. Now, let me tell you how that encourages me. Look here in Psalm 139, verse 5. You hem me in behind and before. You have laid your hand upon me. I don't know about you, but that's encouraging to me. When I was a kid, I used to watch westerns. Any of you remember watching old westerns on Saturday? And what would happen? They'd have that wagon train. And what would they do on that wagon train at the end of the day? Or if they were under attack, they would take all the wagons and they'd put them in a circle, wouldn't they? And they'd put them in a circle. And then when they were attacked, guess what? They were hemmed on the inside. Well, I like to think that God has me hemmed in in the front and in the back. And the hand of God is on me because God is everywhere. When you go to work, God is there. When you go to school, God is there. When you're in a tough place, God is there. And can I tell you something? The devil don't like that. If you don't believe it, just look what happened in the life of Job. In Job 1.10 it says, Have you not put a hedge around him and his household and everything he has? Do you know what the devil was complaining about? The devil was complaining that the presence of God had hemmed in Job. That Satan couldn't get to Job because God had him circled. God had him hemmed in. You see, the omnipresence of God should encourage us. But not only that, the example of Elisha. One day, Elisha's servant looked out, saw the Assyrian army coming, and said, man, we're in deep trouble. And he went running into Elisha, and here's what Elisha prays. 2 Kings verse 16 in chapter 6. Don't be afraid, the prophet answered. Those who are with us are more than those who are with them. And Elisha prayed, O Lord... Open his eyes so he may see. Then the Lord opened the servant's eyes, and he looked, and he saw the hills full of horses, chariots of fire all around Elisha. Do you see everything in the physical world? No. Have you ever seen a germ? There's a lot of things in the physical world we don't see. Well, there's a lot of things in the spiritual world we don't see as well. And here, God opened up the eyes of Elijah's servant that he might see that they were surrounded by the army of God. And they were safe because God's presence was with them. But like I said, it can also challenge us. Proverbs 15, 3 says, The Lord sees He is watching us whether we do good or evil. Joey, I think that's my battery. I don't think that's uh, you. Okay. Well, let's see. (laughs) Prepare, adapt, overcome. (laughs) That's right. See, I'm hemmed in front and back. That's right. Look out, devil. All right. We reloaded now. (laughs) The Lord sees what happens everywhere. He is watching us whether we do good or whether we do evil. God knows all about you. He knows what you're doing online. He knows how you treat your spouse when nobody's watching. He knows whether you're doing your job when the boss is not there or not. I mean, you understand that God is watching whatever you do, whether it is good or whether it's bad, and God's keeping a record of it. It reminds me of a story I read in a small town. You know, it's a sparsely populated county, a little small county seat town. 
One, one horse kind of a town. The judge is there. The district attorney has called Mrs. Jones as a material witness. Now, Mrs. Jones knew everything about everybody. She's the town gossip. And so the district attorney has her up there and says, Miss Jones, do you know who I am? She said, yes, sir, I do, and I want you to know you're a huge disappointment to me. <laughs> says, you're, you're, you're nothing but a liar. Says, you cheat on your wife. You manipulate people. You talk about them behind their back. You're nothing but a two-bit paper pusher. He said, okay, Miss Jones, do you know the defense attorney? He says, yes, I know the defense attorney. He cheated his way through law school. He's a poor excuse of a lawyer. As a matter of fact, he's so sorry he can't find a, a, a woman to marry him. Yeah, I know who he is. About that time, the judge, he cracked that gavel, called both of them up here, and he said, I'm going to tell both of you right now, if either one of you ask her who I am, I'm going to put both of you in jail. <laughs> For contempt of court. <laughs> well, God is everywhere. God sees everything. And because of that, that should challenge us. And then next, notice, we should be challenged because God is present everywhere. Verse 7. I can never escape from your spirit. I can never get away from your presence. If I go up to heaven, you're there. If I go down to the grave, you're there. If I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans, even there your hand will guide me and your strength will support me. You see, wherever you go to, God's already there before you get there. God's where you're at and he's already where you're going to. And God can see us even if we cannot see him. Did you ever play games with your children when they were small? I did, and one of the ki uh, games that my kids love to play, it would be hide and seek, okay? And so what I do is I say, all right, I'm going to count to 10, and I put my hands up over my eyes, and I said, I'm going to count to 10, and you go hide. And what would happen is, is my kids, they go in there, and they hide. They hide behind the couch, and you walk in there, and you see their little old head sticking up behind the couch, <laughs> right? They couldn't see you because they're down below the couch, but you could see them. You see the top of their head, and I'd say, Nathan, where are you? Enoch, where are you? And they'd start snickering, and they laugh. I mean, you know, they couldn't hide. <laughs> but one of the things that they would do occasionally that would just crack me up is they'd go run into the room, and they'd stand over there against a wall, and they'd put their hands over their eyes. And I'm rolling around the room, and I'm saying, Enoch, where are you? Enoch, where are you? And he's over there, he's just shaking, you know, like it. And I say, where is he? Where is he? And he thought because he couldn't see me, I couldn't see him. And just because you can't see God doesn't mean God can't see you. God is everywhere. But you see, sometimes we think, oh, I'm just going to run away from God. The only problem is, is wherever you run to, he's already there. Let me give you an example of Jonah. In Jonah chapter 1, verse 3, but Jonah ran away from the Lord and headed for Tarshish. He went down to Joppa, where he found a ship bound for that port. After paying the fare, he went aboard and sailed for Tarshish to flee from the Lord. You see, God had said, I want you to go to Nineveh, the capital of Assyria. Nineveh is Mosul, Iraq today. And so he's here, he's here in Israel, and God said, I want you to go east. And so what does he do? He gets on a boat, and he says, I'm headed to Tarshish. That's towards Spain. I'm heading in the opposite direction of where God told me to go. Can I tell you, there's always a boat waiting to take you in the opposite direction of the will of God. But notice he had to pay to get on that boat. It always costs you something to run from God. But what happened? He ran from God, ran into a storm. A great fish swallowed him and took him on the first submarine ride and regurgitated him on the shoreline ready to go to Nineveh. See, you can't run from God. Why? He's already where you're running to. But let me just share a couple things that cannot separate you from God's presence. Number one, death cannot separate me from God. In verse 8, if I go up to the heaven, you are there. If I go down to the grave, you are there. 
You know, death invades our ranks, all of us. We have to experience death. And death separates us from those that we love. But if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, when you die here, you spend forever and ever with God, and you're never going to be separated again from the people that you love. You see, the omnipresence of God comforts us and encourages us. Not only that, but distance cannot separate me from God. In verse 9, if I ride the wings of the morning, if I dwell by the farthest oceans. Now, that was written 3,000 years ago. Man has only known how to fly in the last 100 years. But even then, the psalmist could say, God flies on the wings of the morning. And then in verse 3 of Psalm 104, you make the clouds your chariot. You ride upon the wings of the morning of the wind. A couple of weeks ago, some of us went down to Puerto Rico. Oh, my, my. And I had the opportunity to sit in a window seat right behind the wing. And I'm sitting over there behind it, and you know, I can be a little unsettling, especially when we run into turbulence, you look out there, and that wing's going, flop, 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 flop. <laughs> and I'm like, okay. But as I was sitting there, I couldn't help but think of this verse that he rides on the wings of the wind, and the clouds are his chariots. And I got to singing about that song that we sing around here sometimes. Uh, Behold, he comes riding on the clouds. And I just pictured Jesus out there on those clouds, and I said, well, them wings can flop all they want to because God's right out there. You know, at seven miles above the earth, God's just as much there as he is right here. Distance cannot separate you from God. And then number three, darkness cannot separate me. Verse 11, I could ask the darkness to hide me and the light around me to become night. But even in darkness, I cannot hide from you. To you, the night shines as bright as the day. Darkness and light are the same to you. Do you understand that God is a part of every secret conversation? You can't get in a dark place and whisper real low that God doesn't hear it and God doesn't see it. I understand that the United States military is the greatest military force the world has ever known. And and when they really shine is at night. And they say that the American military owns the night, and it's because of the night vision goggles that they have. And so many times they go in at night under the cover of darkness. The enemy cannot see them, but they can see the enemy. Now, I've never had on night vision goggles, but what I've seen of them, everything is green. But I want you to know when God looks into the dark, it's all in living color. Every detail God sees. So the first thing we see is the presence of God will challenge us. Number two, the presence of God corrects me in at least two ways. Number one, he corrects my words. Verse number four, even before a word is on my tongue, behold, O Lord, you know it altogether. Did you ever say any four-letter words as a child that wasn't love or hope? I remember one time I said one of those four-letter words, and my mother heard me. And we went in there, and I had an appointment with ivory soap. And I had an experience that we call washing your mouth out with soap. You know what? It only took one time. One time. And after that, as soon as my feet hit the back steps of the house, I could clean it up. I didn't like ivory soap. But you know, all those other times that I was around and my mother wasn't around, did you know what? God was around. God heard everything that was being said. Have any of you ever got a call from somebody? Joe Bates says, has anybody anybody been butt-dialed besides me? Joe Bates butt-dialed you. It happens on a regular basis, doesn't it, Joe? We don't know why he calls me. But somebody will butt dial you, and you pick up your phone, and you say, hello, hello, and there's somebody on the other end, and if you wait a minute, you can hear them start talking. Mm. Yeah, okay. Gary, Gary Sheely got me on this one day. 
One day I accidentally called Gary Sheely. Anyhow, I looked down there to pick up my phone. It said I'd been talking to Gary Sheely for about six minutes. <laughs> I don't know why he didn't hang up. <laughs> but next time I saw Gary Sheely, he said, Preacher, i got to talk to you. I said, what do you mean talk about me? He said, well, you butt dialed me, and I heard every word you said. And I'm thinking, what would I say? <laughs> I didn't remember what, what I said. He was just giving me a hard time. He didn't hear me say anything. (laughs) He said, I don't know. But talk about that. When I first came to Anthony Grove 20 years ago, by the way, it's 20 years ago yesterday, I came to Anthony Grove Baptist Church. They've gone by really, really fast. But we had a guy here, and he had a lawnmower shop in his backyard. He was picking my weed eater, and I went to pick it up. His name is Lloyd Bumgardner. And I went there, and there's about seven or eight other guys there. And, and he, he's giving them all orders as I'm getting out of my car. It's my new preacher. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. So I walked up there, and everybody's nice and friendly. And one of the guys is a highway patrolman, and he was off duty. And I said, oh, the highway patrol's been in the news. They've been criticized for this, this, this. And while, man, I'm telling you, his face turned red. He got all mad about what the newspaper was saying. And he let out one of them words. And he said, oh, preacher, preacher, I'm sorry. I hope he apologized seven times before I left. And I said, you don't have to answer to me. You have to answer to God. And God heard everything you said before I got here. And God's going to hear everything you say after I leave. You see, the omnipresence of God ought to correct our words. As a matter of fact, the psalmist prayed, Lord, put a guard over my mouth. Some of y'all need to pray that same prayer. (laughs) It corrects my words. Number two, it corrects my walk. Verse three You discern my going out, my lying down. You are familiar with all my ways. You're familiar with all my ways. Yesterday, Dakota and Penny got married, okay? About a year from now, I'll be able to go to Dakota or Penny. And I said, have you become familiar with all their ways? (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Well, God is familiar with all of our ways, and that ought to correct how we behave. It ought to correct how we act. It ought to correct how we treat one another because God's watching. Peter Lloyd's an eccentric preacher. You know what that is? That means he's a little crazy, okay? That's all eccentric means. He's a little crazy. He came to church one day, and he climbed up in the ceiling. He had a little hole in the ceiling. He's there watching everybody, and he had a cordless microphone. And one old guy, he's sitting out there, and he's fiddling with his watch, and he says, Hello, Jack. What are you looking at your watch for? It's not time to go yet. And and everybody's looking around and saying, Where's the preacher? Where's I don't see him. Where's he at? A little bit later, Betty's digging in her pocketbook, and he comes on the, on the microphone. He said, Betty, have you lost something? I see you digging in your pocket, pocketbook, and she's looking all around. You see, he was watching what they were doing. They couldn't see him. God is watching what you and I are doing, and that ought to correct our walk. You say, preacher, I don't get it. Yes, you do. You're riding down the road. You're not paying attention to your driving. You look in the back of the mirror, and you see a police car behind you. All of a sudden, that corrects your driving. You become the most textbook driver, both hands, signals. I mean, you know, the whole thing. God is watching. And then lastly, number three, the presence of God comforts me. In verse 6, such knowledge is too wonderful for me, too lofty for me to attain. What is he saying? When I realize that God is with me all the time, everywhere, that comforts me, that I'm in the presence of somebody that is all-powerful, all-knowing, and all-loving, and they're on my side. It comforts me. It comforts me with a helper. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a helper. Notice here in John 14, verse 16. I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, the Spirit of truth. Then Paul describes it this way in 1 Corinthians 6. Don't you realize that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who lives in you 
and was given to you by God. You do not belong to yourself. Now, the word there, helper, is an interesting word. It is the word parakaleo, and it means to walk along somebody and call out to them. It's kind of like a coach or a, a personal trainer. And I know some of you, you're trying to get in shape, and you're on a diet, and you're trying to, to eat right, and you're trying to exercise. Can you imagine having a personal trainer that everywhere you go, they're calling out to you, oh, you can do it, you can do it. Oh, no, you don't want any of that. That's, going to, that's not going to be good for you. Oh, you go a little farther. You go a little farther. You know, people like uh, Oprah Winfrey, they have personal trainers that go with them and help them. Well, if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, you have a helper. His name is the Holy Spirit, and he calls out to you. He encourages you. You can do it. He is your coach. He is your personal trainer. And then next, he comforts us in times of heartache. Psalm 23, 4. And the New Living Translation says, Even when I walk through the darkest valley, I will not be afraid. For you are close beside me. Your rod and staff protect and comfort me. Folks, if you live long enough, something's going to break your heart. It might be death, it might be disease, it might be sickness, it might be betrayal, it might be rejection, uh, it might be downsizing, but something is going to break your heart at some time. And it is a comfort to know that you're not alone, that in that darkest hour, the God of heaven is right there beside you all the way. Yesterday we had a wedding here and it was a joyous occasion and we got a phone call that one of the men in our church possibly had a stroke. As soon as the wedding ceremony was over, Pastor Ken went to the hospital. I was still here at the wedding. He said, I'll call and give you an update. And it wasn't long after that and Brother Ken called and he said, Pastor Harold didn't make it. Harold didn't make it. He said, the family is fixing to leave the hospital. I said, all right, I'm going to go by their home. And I went by there, and there was Reba, and there was Julie, and there was Charles. And you know what? Their heart was broke. Their heart was broke that Harold was gone. But I want you to know, even though their heart was broke, there was a, a peace that passes all understanding. And his wife of over 50 years said to me, said, Pastor, God answered Harold's prayer. God been praying. God, take me home. Harold said, God, take me home. And she said, Preacher, God took him home. You see, there is comfort in the presence of God, even in the darkest nights, knowing that you're not alone that God is there every step of the way. And then lastly, he comforts us in times of hostilities. Verse 10, even there your hand will guide me. Your right hand will hold me fast. What is the word there? He says, even there. That was on the other side of the ocean. And the ocean to the Hebrews was a, was a scary place. They didn't know where the ocean went. As a matter of fact, the New Testament has the Antichrist coming up out of the sea. And so they saw it as a, an evil place. He said, you know, even in an evil place, God is there with me. You see, if you make a stand for good, if you make a stand for right, if you make a stand for God, you're going to run into the devil. You're going to run into evil. You're going to run in against people that are going to push back on you. And when that happens, God is with you. I have a pastor friend, and he pastors in a large urban area, millions of people. And there's a guy in his church, and he is, he is the uh, captain of the SWAT team this big metropolitan area. And he came to him one day, and he says to him, he said, Pastor, I'd like for you to ride along with me. We're going to go out and serve some warrants, make some arrests. <laughs> he said, okay, let's go. Let's do it. And they're out there, and he says, now, everything should go as planned. He said, but we're looking for a guy, and we don't know his real name, but we call him Rambo. He's a hit man for the drug cartel. He's a really, really bad dude. Killed lots of people. He said, but 
Hopefully we won't run into him. And he said, so we went to these drug raids. We went to this place and that place. And, and my pastor friend, he said, you know what? I was never afraid. He said, the guy in charge of the SWAT team, he's former special forces. Says he can bench press about 500 pounds. He said, you know, he's taking out terrorists. I didn't have anything to be afraid of as long as I was with him. He said, but we pulled up one place, and he said, I think Rambo's in this building. He said, now, preacher, you stay in the car. Don't you get out here. You hear me? He said, here, here's a gun. He said, oh, you're going to give me a gun? He said, yeah, if anybody comes to the car, shoot them in the head. He said, do what? He said, you heard me. This is a bad place. This is a bad man. And my preacher friend said, I sat there in that police car with that gun, scared to death. He said, you know why I was scared to death? He said, Jim was on the inside of the house, and I was out there by myself. Can I tell you there's somebody bigger, somebody greater, somebody badder than the SWAT team, badder than Jim, badder than Rambo, and he's with you all the time. He is the God of this universe. He is your Father if you are a believer in Jesus Christ, and that ought to comfort you that when you're up against the wall and your back is up against it, God is right there with you. All the time. I'm going to ask you to bow your head. Nobody's looking around. Where is God? He's right here. He's right here today. And if you're not a believer in Jesus Christ, He's knocking on your heart right now. And He's saying, open the door. Invite me to come in to that special place in your life. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God says, I want to encourage you today. I want to encourage you that I'm there with you in the dark times. I'm there with you in the hard times. I'm there with you when your back is up against the wall. Some of you came in here today and you're just discouraged. And God said, I want to encourage you. I'm there with you every step of the way. Where is God? God is in this place. He's tugging on hearts. He's saying, let my walk change your walk. Let my presence change your life. Heavenly Father, Lord, as we have a time of decision-making and commitment, Lord, may we choose to honor you with our words, with our lips, with our lives. And God, when life is hard, life is difficult, and our backs are up against the wall, Help us to God to be encouraged that you're there with us every step of the way. Lead us now, God, as we make our decisions. We'll make our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. If you would please stand as we sing, we invite you to come. Thank you. You may be seated. I hope that song will be your prayer. 
And Lord, that I might trust you more. Pastor Ken's going to share some prayer concerns. We'll have our closing prayer and be dismissed. I want to remind you that this is Labor Day weekend. We will not have discipleship classes or worship tonight. Hope you'll use this time to uh, enjoy being with your family. Thank you, Pastor. Pastor's talking about Rambo <laughs> being a nickname. I couldn't help. You know, sometimes we're guilty of giving folks nicknames. We got a man in our church. He said kidney stones, gall stones. If he could have any other kind of stone, he'd have it. So he went in the hospital the other day and was in registration. I went there and I was waiting for him to get there. And uh, he was sitting there registering. And I walked in. I said, ma'am, I know you want to register this man. But I'd like to pray with him before you do that, if you don't mind. She said, sure. I said, well, Rocky, we want to have a prayer with you. <laughs> well, I left. I talked to him after that. He said, you got something started. I said, what do you mean? She said, he said, that lady, after she registered me, called me Rocky. <laughs> I won't call nobody anybody's name. I don't want to embarrass anybody because I'm just that kind of a person, you know. <laughs> but Rocky, I hope you get along well. <laughs> If I didn't love this fellow all my heart, I'd never say that. Believe it or not, he loves me. Several requests of prayer we want to mention today. I uh, understand Bobby Caps has been in the hospital. Is he out? Where he is? Where's Bobby? Hold your hand up, Bobby. Okay. All right. Glad to see you. Didn't see you in the hospital, but we're praying for you. Uh, Joshua Walling, we've been asked to pray for this family. God might be with him. Tracy Christman has been in the hospital. We'll remember her. Uh, we also will remember Gary Sillium. Uh, he has a bleeding on the brain. Tim Hovick, one of our fellows here at the church, has had some problems this week. We're praying for Tim. Where are you? I'm looking for him. We've been rem Yeah, you are. Remember, we're remembering you in our prayers. And uh, understand Joy's grandmother passed away, Joy Choate. We've been praying for this family. Ms. Linda Turhoise, this is uh, Kim's mother, has been in the hospital again. And she's, about, she's been there so many times. They've got a name and a room in honor of her, I think, at the hospital. But she's home now, doing well. Brother Larry Kester has had a knee replacement. He's at Carolina Care, praying for him. Ms. Uh, Barbara McDonald has had surgery. She is at Cortland Terrace Rehab. Remember her. Also remembering Ike Brandon. This is Delia's uh, brother, I believe, Delia Celia. Ms. Merle Lingerfelt has been in the hospital. This is Regina's mother, and she's not doing well. Let's remember her as we pray. And her brother, Wayne Huss, lives in Morganton. It's called hospice in with him, and so we need to pray for Wayne that God might be with him as well. And we want to pray for Mark Watson, who will be having uh, surgery. Uh, he's Mark, uh, you know, remembering him in prayer. <laughs> I want to pray for Doris Freeman, who's in rehab at Peak. Remember Doris in your prayers. The family of Mr. Harold Bean, uh, been, as Dennis said, he was there. We went down as a family, and we got there. Uh, Harold had already passed away. So let's remember this family in our prayers that God might be with him. Miss Alma McNeely is in peak. We've been praying for her and visiting her. We we'll pray for Robert Justice. God might be with him. David Haynes is not doing good today. We we'll want to pray for him. God might be with him. I want to pray for Peggy Johnson. Of course, she's having uh, chemo. Remember her. Ms. Maud Norris is in, uh, uh, in rehab now. She's getting out Thursday. We're praying for her. 
Pray for Brother Jerry Millwood, who has an inoperable brain tumor. I had a, a benefit for Jerry last night down at the West Slim Church in Bessemer City. We were there for a while, and I'm so thankful. They raised almost $10,000 for Brother Jerry Millwood yesterday. Pray for him. He's my brother, Brother Dennis's brother, our brother. We love him. Let's pray for him that God will have his way with him. A lot of requests on our connection cards I want to pray about. If you have a request, please let it be known. And by the way, let me thank all of you. I was not here last Sunday. I was in Canton, North Carolina at the Bethel Baptist Church. God sent his power. I thank you so much for praying for our service. God answers prayer. We love you for it. God bless you. Let's go to God and remember all these requests as we pray today. Heavenly Father, I am so grateful for the privilege of knowing you and serving you. As we come to you today, God, so many needs, a lot of needs that's not even on our list, that's on my heart. And God, I just pray today that everyone might be met in accordance to your will. Lord, you told us in your word, not only do you see us, not only do you know, but Lord, what a blessing to know that you are touched with our infirmities. God, you're sufficient to supply all of our needs. God, there's people here today that's lonely. They need a touch from you. There's people heartbroken because of a loss in their family. You're able to help them. There's people, God, today, no doubt that's drifted away from you. They need a touch from you. I just pray, God, you'll undertake for each one. Grant those requests on our connection cards. Grant the request on all of our hearts today. And Lord, I pray as we leave this place, we'll leave it conscious of the kind of God that we have that we know and that we serve that is ever with us. Grant these requests and be with us as we go. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you and thank you for being here.